Okay, um, so I'm going to talk mainly about uh, about failures of deep learning, um, uh, but but first to give you a sense that I'm not just trying to ruin the party. Um, so uh, we we all love uh, deep learning. We do a lot of things with deep learning. I will show you um, some stuff that I'm doing at Mobileye with deep learning. So here is a vehicle detection in Paris. Um, we see um, uh, cars from all directions, and this kind of technology uh, seemed to be uh, uh, science fiction a few years ago. Um, let's go a little bit. This is uh, what we call the free space. This green carpet is uh, the empty space that the car can go to. Uh, you can see that. It's a very complicated uh, <coughs> task. The texture is, is really hard to see. Uh, but still, with deep learning, we, we do it pretty good. Um, this, is, uh, this is how it looks uh, from uh, the car I, I drive every day. Um, this is the Jerusalem to Tel Aviv, and I'm taking the picture while driving while the car drives itself. Um, yeah, yay. So, so, so that's fine. Do you really drive from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv without... Yeah, all the way from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv. Uh, <laughs> no, no, you should, uh, shouldn't be worried. Tell us when um, you're <laughs> <there>. <laughs> This is, um, um, this is uh, uh, an example of, uh, of reinforcement learning uh, in a scenario we call double merge. Uh, the simulation cars the red cars should go to the right and the white cars should go to the left and uh, you can see that uh, uh, we learn very nicely how to uh, perform this very complicated uh, negotiation with uh, other cars um, by the way so, so the this is motivated this yes no uh, just by just by uh, by, by machine vision um, so let me show you. This is the sa basically the same thing. You see, this roundabout is actually a double merge because cars coming from here and wants to go here, and cars coming from here and go to uh, and wants to go there. Okay, so exactly the same scenario, and see how it uh, looks in in reality with human drivers. Uh, look now. Uh oh, um, they weren't sure what to do. Uh, then they shout at each other, and <laughs> then it continues. This is again with um, um, zoom in. So it's it's a pretty complicated task even for human drivers. Um, okay, and if you think that this was uh, difficult, this is much more difficult. Uh, and let me show you. See my mouse. Okay, so this is in Paris, and this is even more difficult. <laughs> you need to yield to uh, other and and to cows. If you see the cow, there is a cow here. Find the cow. Okay. You see? Yeah, right here. <laughs> Everybody yield to the cow. And as you probably know, um, deep learning is also very profitable um, to some of us. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, um, so so yeah, it's great. Deep learning is great, um, but um, we don't really understand what's going on in in, in theory. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about my work on theoretical understanding of uh, deep learning. Um, how can you say it after we heard Tali? <laughs> yeah, so Tali is new work, and I will, I will refer to Tali's work. Um, OK, so um, I will tell you a little bit. Um, so my perspective on deep learning is more computer science-like uh, perspective. Um, and uh, when I started to, uh, uh, to study it, uh, I uh, together with uh, mainly together with Amit Danieli and also with uh, Ohad Shamir and Roy Livni, we developed some 
initial theory of what's going on and why deep learning is so great. And we got really, really strong results, both lower bound, upper bound, great results, irrelevant to anything. Okay, so the first part, which I will do very briefly, is irrelevant, uh, practically irrelevant theory of deep learning. Um, it's still important to understand it, to know what I at least now see as irrelevant, but uh, um, I will try to explain why it is irrelevant. And then uh, when, we, when we figured this out, we wanted to, to do something which is relevant to what really happens in practice. Um, and we felt that the, the best way to make progress is to first to understand uh, what deep learning couldn't do. Uh, because once you understand the boundaries of something, you maybe get a better understanding of what is working. So uh, we try to, to find uh, problems on which deep learning, at least the, deep lear the type of deep learning that people are using very successfully in practice, completely fails. Uh, and we found a family of problems on which deep learning doesn't work. And we analyzed why it doesn't work. And the third part of the talk is a fruit of this understanding of uh, failures of deep learning, where we have some new results on understanding practically relevant theory of deep learning uh, in terms of low and, and high frequencies and what is a part of weight sharing. And these are very new results, so the last part will, will contain some uh, hand-waving argument, but, uh, but I think that some of the things there uh, really captured what's going on in practice. Okay, um, so from the perspective of, of, uh, of PAC learning, what is learning? Learning is uh, some algorithm that receives training data, has some set of models, which is a subset of functions from domain X to, the, to domain Y, and the goal is to, to learn a, an output function, which is a function H from X to Y. So in, in PAC, um, the goal is to have the probability of failure and for simplicity binary classification. So the probability that uh, your model uh, does not capture reality is smaller than the best in class plus epsilon. Uh, and the game is that there is an unknown distribution D over pairs of examples. You can sample from, from D, but you, you do not know D, of course. Otherwise, you can use a base optimal with respect to D. Okay, so this is a pack learning game uh, in, in really four lines. Uh, and in pack learning, the basic theory, we have three considerations of choosing the prior knowledge or this class of functions uh, that we try to learn. One of them is expressiveness. And expressiveness is what is the value of the minimum on the right-hand side. So if, you, if we take a larger hypothesis class, then the minimum on the right-hand side would be smaller. So we want to, to take a larger hypothesis class. On the other hand, there is a question of sample complexity. How many examples, the number n here, we can sample. So if we take a larger class, we need to search over a larger space, so we need more examples. So it's a clear trade-off. But the third thing is computational complexity. To learn, to actually find this function, uh, to find this h, uh, we need to run some learning algorithm, and it takes time. So what is the computational complexity of the learning algorithm? And, and Choice of H uh, affects all of these three things. Um, and so what should be the, ch the best choice of a hypothesis class? A, a classic uh, no free lunch theorem tells us that we, can, we, we must make some assumptions because otherwise the sample complexity is exponentially large in the relevant dimension. Uh, and one extreme that Tali mentioned is shallow learning, SVM, and boosting in which the hypothesis class is linear functions over some space. And this is a strong prior knowledge, but at least we understand it very, very well. In deep learning, the hypothesis class is all the functions that we can implement by determining the weight of a given artificial neural network. What? Um, so what does it mean? This is usually what does it mean in a uh, neural network, and you probably show this picture a lot. I think this is a wrong view of deep learning, this is a good view of artificial neural network. It's, it has nothing to do with what is deep learning in industry. This is deep learning in industry. So deep learning in industry is a computation graph. Okay, we have a graph here. The, the, the nodes of the graph have semantic meaning. For example, there is an input layer X, there are variable layers. These are variables that we want to learn. And there are some layers that perform simple operations. 
And crucially, these operations should be differentiable. Um, so for example, an Affan layer perform an Affan transformation. A ReLU layer perform element-wise the, maxim the maximum between zero and, and, and uh, the input, okay? And then at the end, we have a loss layer and uh, the advantage of, uh, of this computation graph is that if all layers are differentiable, then by backpropagation, uh, we, can, we can train it using gradient descent. So this is what deep learning is. What's the difference between the previous Sorry? So the previous one have nodes which are just a uh, single tone, and then there is a very specific type of uh, weight summation and a nonlinearity sigma. Now, the picture here expresses exactly the thing like the picture before, but this is the way people use deep learning, and this is a, the, the right generality of what deep learning is. Okay. Of course, these are the same in the in the meaning that you can. So I will come to it in a minute. You can express everything in both views, okay? Because both are universal in some sense, okay? But th this is why the, the reason to look at uh, at uh, this re representation is just to to to, to uh, understand that we should forget about the brain, okay? There was motivation about the brain. There is nothing about the brain in, in modern deep learning, okay? No, I am telling it here because I, I think you no, should agree. I, I, I don't agree because some do not agree with it. Actually. It's very That's fine. I it's, it's a very crude approximation of the brain, but it's certainly brain inspired. It's brain inspired. Yeah. But that's the way you describe the brain. Fine. Here is the brain. Whose brain? Let's not argue about semantics, okay? <laughs> okay. So, um, so, so the first thing that, uh, that you should ask yourself, okay, so what can we express with uh, deep networks? And the first answer is that everything, and since I'm a computer scientist, so I will say that everything is every Boolean function because everything is Boolean function. I think it's also true in your brain, right? Um, so every function over n bits to a bit can be expressed by one hidden layer network with radio activation. Uh, the proof is really straightforward. Um, but this theorem, which you can hear a lot, and here I, I disagree with what uh, Tali said uh, at the end, uh, this uh, theorem tells you that you can express everything, but there is a price. The size of the network, the number of neurons should be exponential, <laughs> must be exponential in N. I, I never said it's very structured. No, I mean, the, the argue about depth. Depth helps for expression. There are very strong conditions. Okay. Okay. So, um, so, so, um, so the real question is, what can we express with a network of bounded size? Because we shouldn't care about networks with exponential number of neurons. Okay. So, what can we express with a network of bounded size? So, basically, you're saying that even if it's not one hidden layer, even if it's not, it can be deep. I don't care about the number of layers. It will still be exponential. Right. Yes, yes. But but <laughs> specifically, this claim that every Boolean function, the universally, universal, it's it's really meaningless. Okay, uh, I'm uh, I'm happy that uh, Chaim is like, Chaim agrees with me. Um, okay. So uh, what can we express with a network of bounded size? And and my answer uh, is that everything that we care about, we can expo we, we can express with a network of a, of bounded size. And and the reason, so of course, <coughs> we cannot express everything. In fact, the number of functions that we can express with a bounded size is is tiny with respect to all the possible functions. But these are the functions that we should uh, be interested about. And the reason is that these are the functions that later, after we finish training, we can run in polynomial time. And we shouldn't care about functions, even if they express reality very, very good, but it will take a test time forever to run them, then we shouldn't care about it because we, we will not be able to do anything with such functions, okay? So if we restrict ourselves to functions that later, at test time, we can run efficiently, then a uh, network of bounded sides contains this class. Okay? Is this clear? So you answer that. You don't think about power of computing. 
It's also for parallel because... But if you have a shallow network, exponentially large... The, the even, I, I assume yeah. that I, even if, if you have a distributed machine, I assume that the number of nodes is polynomial in the relevant dimension. Okay, and then there is no difference okay. between... Okay? okay? So uh, we can we can do everything with uh, uh, th that we care about with network of bounded size. The sample complexity is also bounded, uh, and therefore it is the ultimate hypothesis class. Okay, we can do everything that we know with that we want. Sample complexity is bounded, but of course the bad news are the computational complexity of the training process. And here, all most of, most of the results are negative. Uh, so one of them is with uh, my former student Amit. Daniele, who is going to be here next year as a faculty. Um, so uh, even if you look at the depth two networks with just logarithmic number of hidden neurons uh, with any reasonable um, activation function, so the training process is hard in a very, very strong meaning of hardness. Uh, okay, so it's very hard to train uh, deep networks, really. Actually, it's not. So here is another theorem with Ray Livner and Dohad Shamil saying that, okay, what we care about in practice is constant depth, say depth 5, 6, 10, something like that. Uh, and there is usually a constant global bound on the weight entering every neuron that does not depend on the input dimension. So one, once we make these two restrictions on the class, then this class is learnable in polynomial time uh, in the input dimension. So, uh, in the in in the in the generality, if you if you want uh, any bound, uh, if you want uh, uh, no bound on the weight, then it is very very hard. But once you put a bound on the weight, it's not hard. So the difference is in the bound on the weight. Yes. Okay. So the difference is the bound on the weight. Okay. So uh, it's a very strong lower bound and a very uh, strong upper bound, both of them are practically irrelevant, okay? So in theory, it is hard to train depth two networks, but we do train depth two, three, four, five, ten, hundred and fifty, I don't know, uh, networks for many, many practical problems. In theory, it is easy to train constant depth networks with constant bound on the weights, but uh, in practice, the provably correct algorithms are not practical, they have in the polynomial time, they have dimension to the power of 100. <laughs> Yay, polynomial, but it doesn't really help us. And, uh, and in practice, networks of depth 2 to the 20 are trained successfully with stochastic uh, gradient descent. So uh, maybe we need to think differently about computational complexity here. Um, so what is gradient-based uh, learning? I assume that in this audience I don't need to express, to, to explain uh, stochastic gradient descent on neural networks, so I will skip this, uh, um, this slide, but to summarize what is deep learning in, pr in practice, uh, the, the, the way it works is you express a class of functions using a computation graph. The goal of learning is, set to, is to set the variables of the graph, and you do it by initializing the variables, usually at random, then apply SGD, and apply many, many tricks, because there are many, many meta uh, parameters. Uh, but, you know, once you learn it, you find a way to, to tune these parameters. And miraculously, uh, on many practical problems, uh, it works. Okay? So, this is a picture. Um, to, to, make, to make practically relevant uh, theory, we wanted, to, uh, we wanted to understand what fails for the specific gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent algorithm. So now, yes. Why is the theory irrelevant? Why the theory is irrelevant? Because, because so you, you see very strong um, lower bound, but very easily you circumvent them by making some reasonable assumptions. And so it makes the very strong lower bound that you work very, very hard to prove it irrelevant because it doesn't capture what is really difficult in reality. On the other hand, the positive result, which is great, we can train everything, just give me a constant bound, but then the algorithm itself is not something that we can really use. This is why it is irrelevant, okay? So what we wanted to, to understand is take this family of algorithms 
stochastic gradient descent and in particular gradient descent algorithm with some assumption on stochasticity of the, of the algorithm. This is a family of algorithms and we want to understand this specific family and to show where this family of algorithms on which problems it works and, and on, on what problems it doesn't work and maybe this will give us intuition as to what's going on here. Okay. So um, um, what I'm going to show you is um, simple problems, very simple problems, where standard deep learning either does not work well or does not work at all. Okay, and I will give you specific uh, problems. So the first problem, it's going to be a synthetic problem, but it is motivated from this real-world problem. So remember this green carpet. We want to understand the free space, okay? So how we express free space? If I will ask any of you to, you know, draw the, the yellow line of the free space, you will probably draw a piecewise linear curve, okay? Because this is how drawing uh, software in computers work, okay? So um, Tali has a, an iPad, so he will make it smoother, but but the rest of us uh, will do a piecewise linear curve, okay? So let's look at this very, very simplistic. Forget about the image at all, okay? I, I give you uh, a discretization of a curve. So F1, F0, F0, F1, F2, okay? A curve, I give you endpoints of the curve, okay? This is a vector. And this curve is piecewise linear with k pieces meaning there are two k parameters that describe it completely. So I want you to teach a deep network to do the very, very simple thing of taking this vector and giving me the, k, the two k parameters of the curve. Okay? It looks like a very, very simple problem. Okay? Um, so let's see how we tackle it. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is what is called autoencoder. So we will take an encoder network <coughs> that will move the input into 2K numbers, and I chose just three layers network for this. And then we will take a decoding network that will take back the 2K uh, numbers into the N numbers, and I will have the square loss of encoding and then decoding, okay? And I, after I encode the curve and decode it back, I should get the same curve, so the square loss should be smaller. Now there is no problem of expressivity here <coughs> because this network can express this piecewise linear encoding decoding. So really no problem of, uh, of uh, expressivity. There is also no problem of sample complexity. There is enough, I give it enough examples, but okay? I, I, I Yeah, I, I give it I give it a vector with this height, this height, this height, this height, this height, this height. and I, I want to find out that at this point the slope is changing, okay. then at this point uh, point it is changing, the, the point where it changes. Okay, very simple. Okay, so seemingly a very very simple problem. The dimension I chose was hundred. Okay. Uh, this is how it looks after 500 iterations of, uh, of gradient descent, okay? 10,000 iterations, still very bad. 50,000 iterations for such a small problem and it still didn't capture uh, what's going on, okay? So, um, let's... How many examples of uh, minimum, uh, minimum so here, uh, the n we can calculate the number of examples and I gave much more than needed. So I even took the non-relevant theory of VC dimensions that Sally mentioned, okay? It's a very, uh, how you call it, strato something, uh, yeah, something from physics. Uh, something from phy large from physics, uh, upper bound, okay? Uh, yeah, stratosphere, thank you. And, and I took this number and I took more examples than that. You know, okay. In, uh, in L2 norm, for example, it's not such a bad approximation. Uh, do, do you want that this will be the answer for such a simple problem? Uh, it depends how you measure the similarity. It's, 
I mean, it should be better for such a small problem, I mean. Okay, so, so let's, and, and, and even for this, you needed 50,000 iterations. It's crazy, I mean, 50,000 iterations for such a simple problem. Okay, um, this is, for me, it looks disappointing. Okay, so let's understand what's going on. Um, so, uh, actually, if you think about this problem, you can formulate it as a convex optimization problem uh, by some trick. Never mind the trick. So think now it's actually least square regression. Okay? So let's do it. Formulate it as a convex uh, problem. And yeah, it looks better now. Okay? But it's still very, very bad. Look, this is after 50. So for one curve it worked. For other curve it didn't work. Okay? So now it's convex. We know that it should converge. What's going on here? So what's going on here? This part we understand. We understand that stochastic gradient descent and in general gradient descent algorithm, the convergence is governed by the condition number of the problem. And here you can calculate the condition number and see that it grows like n to the power of 3.5. Okay? It means that you need n to the power of 3.5 iterations uh, to succeed. Okay? And other grad, Adam, all these tricks, here they will not work. N is the size of the input. N is the, the size of the input, the and number. W is the, is the, the W is this, uh, yeah. It's the best solution in the convex formulation. Yes. Okay, so we understand that there is not a problem of local minima here because it's convex. There is no saddle point because it's convex. Everything is nice. There is a different problem, geometry. So there are geometry uh, of the optimization surface, which makes the problem hard, even though it's not local minima, it's not saddle points, it's something else. And in practice, you will see this problem more often than you will see local minima. Are these, are these long valleys that are showing? It's not, it's, it's like a, um, a pita. Flat area, yeah. The gradient does not, in, I mean, yeah. Um, the gradient does not, uh, is this a pointer? Yeah. So think about the, uh, the, the level set as something like this, okay? So the gradient here points here instead of here. So when I was a kid, that's what they blamed. That's, that's why it said, they said different um, stack boxes grow because of these long values. Right? Exactly. But recently, they don't, don't say that anymore. Right? I mean yeah, they don't say it for some reason, <laughs> so for some reason. Uh, I will I will try to explain why how how we circumvent this because it actually help uh, to understand. So let's do uh, two more steps and then we will see why they don't say it. Okay. So uh, third try. Let let's pose actually this problem can be posed as a convolution as a one-dimensional convolution because basically we need to calculate second derivative. Okay. And it's the same for every for every area of the curve. So if we pose it as a convolution, and I will do it quickly, then now we see that after 50,000 iterations, uh, it works. It suddenly works, okay? But still, 50,000 iterations, right? This is still crazy. Uh, and the thing is that condition number now reduced to n to the power of 3. It was n to the power of 3.5. So we gain square root of n, which is factor of 10 here, okay? It's good but it's still disappointing. So let's do one more step. Mar oh, one more step, we will do conditioning to the problem, and this is what is known as batch norm, okay? And when you do batch norm with convolution, now, after 500 iterations, everything works, okay? And this is what you expect, that after, for such a simple problem, after 500 iterations, things work. So w what is the lesson that we learn? The SGD might be extremely slow, and prior knowledge here allows us not to have a better sample complexity. Sample complexity was not the issue here at all. It is not also for stochastic gradient descent. So, so it's not for prior. Uh, the prior knowledge is not for sample complexity. It's also not for expressivity. These were non issue before. It's for computational complexity of training. And this is, a, I think, an important point uh, that I will come back to it later, okay? Um, 
So I have another example, but I don't have time, so let me skip this example and, and, and move to a more interesting example. So here, the problem is deep is for the composition of, composition of functions, right? This is where deep should be uh, beneficial, okay? So let's uh, take a very simple problem. I have examples of images. These images have a single line, and it has a slope, either positive or negative. Okay, so the first function is to take an image and to say if the slope is positive or negative. This is F1. Okay, now F2, uh, you take K tuple of images, you take their slope, and then you take the parity of this. Now I know that parity is not an, in an interesting function, but I will come back to it later. Okay, so, and, and the goal is to learn the composition. So think about K as being three. I have three images, they have slope, positive or negative. The label is the parity of the slope of the three images. Again, it's just three images. Should be very easy, right? So let's, let's look at two approaches to tackle it. One is, one is the end-to-end -end approach, okay? The end-to-end -end approach is we have input three images, output is the parity, we back propagate, that's it, okay? The second is the composition approach, where we use our prior knowledge that we know that we first need to find the slope and then the parity, so we add loss function on the intermediate layer that, uh, that should find the slope, okay? So we inject loss function both at the end, but in the middle as well, okay? These are two architectures. Now let's look what happened here. It's accuracy as a function of iteration. <coughs> So when k equals 1, so we just need to learn the slope of a single image, then red and blue, which are the two approaches, end-to-end -end and the composition, both works. k equals 2, still both work. Already at k equals 3, the decomposition approach still works, okay? But the end-to-end -end approach stays on a random guess. It doesn't go to 1, or this is 1? Uh, it doesn't go to 1. Maybe it will... Uh, in time, but if but not not sure because if you will see the pictures that we use, it's not always very easy to understand the, the slope. So maybe with more training, it will go to one. But the problem was not really trivial, okay? But but for k equals three, the interesting thing is the failure, the complete failure of the end-to-end -end approach, okay? So here, seemingly, it's not a complicated task. Finding the slope, we see that it is an easy, easy task for deep learning, okay? But finding the slopes and then taking parity of just three images and then backpropagating it, this is completely impossible for, for backpropagation, okay? Such a simple thing. Um, so why it doesn't work? Um, you can, you can think about one explanation as being local minima. There are local minima. But we prove that there are no local minima here. Okay? There are no local minima which are not global. So it's not the explanation. The actual explanation, explanation is signal-to-noise ratio. So what we show is that um, if, if you look uh, why there is noise, and I need to explain why, the, why there is noise. There is always noise in learning because you work on finite sample, okay? So I assume that training is done by taking gradients of polynomial in many examples. You cannot take all the distribution and take the gradient of it. If you will take all the distribution and take the gradient of it, then you will be able to solve this. But because you take only finite sample in order to calculate the gradient, then there will be inherently noise your estimate of the gradient will be just estimate of the true gradient of the true objective, okay? And this noise relatively to the gradient is dropping very, very fast and already for k equals three, it's below machine precision. So it's not surprising that nothing good can happen. But, but if, if, there is, if the noise is, this is the signal, the signal, here the signal drops down, so, and there is a fixed amount of noise because of the sampling, so the signal-to-noise ratio, the, the reason it fails is because of the signal-to-noise. It's very flat. It's, it's, it's actually not very flat, okay? I will come to it. It's not very flat, uh, it's something else. I will, 
elaborate on it in a, in a minute. Ah, here it is. Okay. So here is here is a, a better explanation. Okay. Uh, so what's going on here is that um, suppose that you have a family of orthonormal functions, functions that have no correlation. Okay. Now the target function that you want to learn will come from this family, but of course you don't know which one will be the will be the um, uh, the function. Okay, and I allow you to learn H using gradient-based deep learning. You can choose any architecture that you want. Okay, any architecture that you want. Um, so what is the learning task? The learning task is to minimize F H of W with which is the expectation over the input, uh, input, some loss function, you can also choose a loss function, um, of your uh, network, architecture of the network, prompt by, by the vector w, of x versus h of x. This is your, this is the task. And I only assume that you start with a random w and then update the weights based on the gradient, okay? And to, to explain the failure, we will look on the information that the gradient of the objective tells us about the individual target function. Of course, we don't know the target function. Okay, we only know to take estimation of this based on something. Okay, so the question is how much information do we have on the, on the individual function? And the way to analyze is, is to look at the variance so if, if I randomly take a target function from the class, I can compare the actual gradient to the average gradient with respect to the class. And the theorem tells that this, grow, uh, this uh, goes to zero with one over the size of the class. What does it mean? It means that if you have an exponentially uh, large class, then the information on the individual function goes to zero. So the gradient can be non-zero but the information on the individual target is very, very small. Let me, show a, let me show the visualization. Uh, so this is an example of flatness, but uh, this is a better uh, visualization of, of the failure. So look, suppose that you have two functions, the blue and the red, okay? At this point, the gradient is not zero. There is curvature. The blue and the green? I'm colorblind, so. The, the blue and the, the, and the other one. <laughs> the blue and the other blue. Um, <laughs> so, so look at this point. At this point, the gradient is not zero. There is derivative, okay? There is curvature here, okay? But when you see the derivative, you don't know if you optimize the red or the blue. The, the green, the other blue. <laughs> I really don't know <laughs> which one, okay? So, and, and, the, and these two functions have very different global minima, okay? So if you, if you do gradient descent, there is no reason that the gradient tells you that you optimize this function or that function. And suppose that this happens for exponential number of functions, then you are doomed. And this is what happens. So we see um, many type of uh, of failures, this is the one failure, the flatness that I, that I showed in the beginning, signal to noise ratio, and the another one that I didn't uh, show. Uh, but let me, let me go on to, to get some positive results out of these failures. I do have some few, few more minutes. Okay, so I will try to do it very, very uh, fast. Okay, um, so, so, so we have, a, we have some, something that I'm, <laughs> I'm very excited about. Um, so look at, again, a very simple problem of, the composition, of composition. So we want to learn a composition of G star over sigma over H star, where H star is the first function, it is a linear function from dk to k. Sigma is just element-wise sigmoidal activation. And then G star is some arbitrary function, uh, say it is Lipschitz, but k is very small say three, four, five, okay? So we start from high dimension. D is larger than K, so say D is 100. So we start, we start from dimension uh, 300. 
we go into dimension three, okay, by a linear function. And then we do some nonlinear and some function, okay? And now the question, what are the properties of both H and G that lead to efficiency of, uh, of gradient descent? And we underscore two properties, one of H and one of G, okay? So first, the first thing is that uh, for G, starting with G, we distinguish between low and high frequencies. So think about G as actually a Boolean function over KB. So if you, if, you, if you look at the Fourier transform of the class of functions from plus minus one be, uh, to the power of K to plus one minus one, then the characters of this Fourier transform are parity functions, okay? So we have, this is the highest fre frequency, it's a parity of all bits, and this is the lowest frequency, it's a parity of the, of the smallest bit. But the same will, will happen for a, basically any group that you will take, if you take real function with the usual Fourier series or whatever, okay? Now, the theorem that we show is that under some conditions, if you try to, uh, to learn G low with gradient descent, then it will work quickly, even though it's non-convex, but we prove that it works. But if you want to learn G high, to optimize G high, then you will need D to the power of K iterations so that gradient descent will start showing some progress, okay? So there is really uh, what uh, deep networks can learn, only low frequency phenomena. Okay, and why it works in practice? Because reality is low frequency. At least it works for the for computer vision. What we see in our brain is just low frequencies. We cannot see high frequencies, and deep learning cannot learn high frequencies. The information is only in the high frequencies. Can you explain again what do you find as high and low field? So um, you know, let me let How me. Let, let me uh, let me few more slides to finish, and then I will take questions because I don't want to be too much uh, over time. Um, the, the reality, the answer to reality is what about combination of frequency? Because in reality, we will not we will not have parity. We will have some function which has both low and high frequencies. And the question is, what can we learn when we have combination? And of course, we will look at simplistic things where we just have the highest frequency and the lowest frequency, okay? And here, there is something very, very interesting. There is a difference, now we, we go back to the linear layer in the beginning, and there is a difference between convolution and fully connected layers, which, which I find very interesting and in line with what, what we see in practice. So, probably don't need to explain what is convolution and fully connected, but, but here it's very natural to look at weight sharing convolution and fully connected without. And the theorem tells us that if we, if we use convolution, we use weight sharing, then gradient descent learns the combination of low and high frequencies. But if we don't have weight sharing, then we need exponential number of iterations for gradient descent, which is in line uh, in what happens in practice. So in, on the top uh, here, you see what happens on real data, uh, on MNIST here. And on the bottom, you see our theorem, which is on synthetic, we, we assume Gaussian inputs and, you know, all these simplistic assumptions. And you see that basically the same phenomena happens in both. So if the target is only high frequency, convolution will not help you, nothing will help you. You cannot learn just high frequency function, okay? But maybe in reality, there are no pure high frequency functions. If you have low frequency function, then both work. Everything works for low frequency. When you have combination of high and low, which is, I believe, what happens in reality, then there is a, a huge distinc distinction between fully connected and convolution. Fully connected cannot learn the high frequency part. It only learns the low frequency part while convolution learns both the high and low frequency. And intuitively, what happens is that because you have weight sharing, you first learn the low frequency part using, uh, because low frequency is easy. Once you figure out the low frequency, now you rely on the fact that you are in a low dimensional space because K is small. And then in low dimensional space, you can learn even high, high frequency functions. 
So overall, you learn a high-frequency function over a large dimension by first figuring out the low dim dimensional part and then learning the rest. And this is something, by the way, that in practice, um, I see all the time. The real power of deep learning is only when you have weight sharing. Convolutions, recurrent neural networks, this is where deep learning is better than other technology. In fully connected networks, at least in my experience, I couldn't find a single problem where deep learning was better than alternatives. And the alternative is SVM, boosting, random kitchen sinks, random forests, all, all the other machinery that we know. Okay, so where in, in fully connected, when you do not have structure, I couldn't find an example where deep learning is really better than alternatives. But in convolutions and uh, recurrent neural networks, deep learning, w there are problems on which deep learning is the only machinery that really gives good results. And this is at least an initial theory of understanding what really is going on there. It's all about optimization. It's not about um, expressiveness. It's not about sample complexity. These are minor things because the difference between convolution and fully connected in terms of sample complexity is just polynomial difference. But in computational complexity is exponential difference. Okay, so I will stop here. Thank you. <laughs> Did I answer your question? Maybe you didn't, but I, I, I have an answer for the real world, which is interesting in my view. And again, it goes to the debate if it uh, affects the brain or not. But what one of the things in the brain, you know, the reverse hierarchy idea, and the Stalin idea, and this, is that first you need to understand the whole, which is low frequency, and then you understand the detail, which is high frequency. Exactly. So this is exactly this phenomenon. There, there is low frequency, the whole, and only when you couple the, the, uh, the whole and the details with the same weight, then you can figure out the details. If you do not couple them, then you, you cannot. It's beautiful. Thank so you. Thank you. No, it's completely different because um, the, here it's not a question. It's not a question of express, expressing things in one way or another. The same architecture, the fully connected, can ex can can achieve uh, uh, the epsilon balls of uh, of I, I must disagree, but we don't want to argue now. Uh, the, the, the epsilon cover is just an analog of the Lyquist frequency sampling theorem. Essentially, it tells you how often you need to sample your function in order to approximate. And, and uh, just as you said, I mean, high frequency, you need high, you, you're never going to capture with, with very low sampling. And uh, so essentially, it's a, it, it, the fact that you can cover it with epsilon cover is completely analogous to the sampling theorems in, in signal processing, and uh, I think they are very closely related to what you're saying. Any additional questions? Okay, so let's thank both Danny and Sarah.